Hello, how are you guys doing today on the show? We had the amazing, uh, the spectacular Mr. Roger Avery. You may have heard of Roger because you may have heard of the Oscars. Heard of the Oscars? Little known talent competition in the US of A. It's whether you have these big gold like trophies that our people worship and like destroy each other over. Really, it's a bit sad. However, this is a fun one because we talk about Roger writing pulp fiction. Pulp Fiction, if you haven't heard about it, I mean, you've been living under, I'm not going to say a rock, I'm going to say a boulder, because you've been living under a big, giant boulder if you haven't heard of Pulp Fiction. One of the best films of all time. Roger Avery co-wrote it with Quentin Tarantino after working with him in a video store. Quite a crazy progression from a video store into an Oscar winner, but that's a story we're telling today. So much fun. Roger has the most amazing office in the world. There's all these old arcade computer games, which he collects and we talk about in his office. We also got to to mess around with the video camera that that they used to shoot the Godfather? Heard of The Godfather? The Godfather. You come to me on the day. You know what I'm talking about. I don't do the whole accent. I'm not going to do the accent. I can't do Italian accents. People will say, Ferg, you sound racist doing the Italian accent. I'm sorry. Mamma mia. I've gone to it again. Hope you enjoy the show. This is a fun one. It's a good one. I've probably set this introduction. The pace is too fast because this is a 90-minute show. So let's just relax. If you need to meditate, do it. It's a 90-minute show. So enjoyable. Takes a journey. Stay with us. You're going to get a lot out of it. This is the Ferg Neil Show. There's some people you want to know. Don't worry because he will say hello for you. Here we go. It's the Ferg Neil Show. The idea of slack and that uh, mankind wants to basically just lay on a couch. Yeah. I mean, that is what we, everything that we, there are arguments to, that have been made, you know, again, academically, yeah. <laughs> that, um, that this is the reason for all of the hard work we do is for relaxation time. Yeah, and yeah, sometimes yeah. you just need to be alone and chill yeah. and watch Netflix There's, you know, or, or something like that. Yeah. We also need the campfire experience. Mm. That's, I think, super important culturally. And I think that's really the heart of what Quentin and Chris Nolan yeah. and guys like that and Paul, Tom Sanderson, and you know, all these guys, it's really, I think, what they're... Um, getting at more than anything is that we need as a culture to come together and sit around the campfire and have a story told to us that delights and charms and uh, scares us and you know makes us feel love and why do you think humans need that why do you think there is like a desire why do you think like film has even come into existence in human culture like why is there some need to like well it's it's the it's the need for storytelling more than anything it's the need for um transmitting downward through the ages Kind of, uh, I mean, it's. I, I mean, I hate to say a meme, but mm. you know, cultural memes yeah. and so um, what cultural wants cultural did. ideas and. Yeah. You know, one of the projects I've adapted was Beowulf, and Beowulf existed mm, yeah, yeah. as an oral tradition for hundreds and hundreds of years before it's finally put to paper. Mm. And you can't tell me that over the course of that time that the story doesn't get augmented and changed and amped up a little bit and mm. juiced in some parts, and so that uh, um, you know the story changes over time depending on who's telling the story and actually who the audience is. Yeah, because ultimately, yeah. there's somebody who is, the, and in those days. The, the writer, the, the song, the singer was called the shop, with the, derives from the word to shape. And so you were the shaper mm. of the story. And what you're doing is you're taking these kind of cultural ideas that are sometimes based on reality, even if they're a story. You know, um, Beowulf you know, and, uh, you know, is, is connected to other bits of literature. And yeah. you know, the idea is that you know, there are elements within Beowulf that maybe aren't taken f- fully literally but are, uh, you know, based on things that really happened, you know, and, and people that really existed, mm. just like how some movies that come out today, which might be a fantasy or a horror movie, you know, have relations to politics and, yeah. and uh, uh, Kardashians. You know, you watch the movie Clueless. It's really, it's actually, it's about the creation of the Kardashians. Yeah. Bef- and before anybody even knew who they were. Yeah. Because it's about Robert Kardashian and his daughter and uh, and this kind of clueless, vapid culture. Yeah. And I mean, it's that's kind of a brilliant. Uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. but that's encoded into the work, and it's encoded for the current audience. You know, that doesn't mean anything to audiences two, three generations away necessarily. Yeah. Unless it's like unless it's super profound and resonates. And so when Beowulf is put to text, 
uh, Christian monks are uh, you know come in and they're actually the ones who are doing the writing and yeah. so they add yeah. elements of Christianity to yeah. the story and so the story kind of you know changes over time yeah but throughout all of it there's like this des- this kind of human need to hear the story and to tell the story mm. and that I think comes from telling us who we are I think we learn more about who we are as a culture and as a people from our myths and traditions okay. and movies and storytelling yeah. than we actually do from history, okay. which to me is just told by the victor and is sometimes uh, lacking in a greater depth yeah. of, uh, you know, a greater kind of uh, story depth. To me, there's two things in a screenplay. I don't mean to constantly... <laughs> no, no, go for it. Um, but uh, to me, there's two things in um, in a movie and... and at least as a writer, and one is, or as a, I look at it as a, as a, as a full filmmaker, not necessarily as a writer, but is story and plot, and the two are very, very different. Okay, and can you explain that? Well, um, people will go see a movie for a plot once. People will go see a movie for a story again and again and again. What's again. a plot-driven film that you think of? Well, let me ask you. Have, do you know the movie Towering Inferno? No. Probably not. Um, <laughs> it's probably a bad example. It's like an old person's example. Um, you call my dad enough. Yeah, ex- exactly. Okay, like, let me think of a, uh, of a recent movie, you know, um, Transformers. Uh, okay, go with yeah, a big yeah. one, Transformers. Yeah. What is yeah, the plot? The, the plot of Transformers, I don't know, 5. What is the plot of Transformers 1? Yeah. Like... I mean, unless you really, really know, and unless they were really close to the canon of the source material, and you know, maybe you are, uh, the plot is. I mean, I can't even. I can't tell you what the plot is. Yeah. I know that Shia LaBeouf and kind of likes a girl, <laughs> and I think there's some somebody from space, and yeah. I, like I don't know what the plot is, but I yeah. guarantee the plot is super thin. What the mm. story is is robots transforming into cars and jumping around and like you know battling whatever yeah it's giant fights and things like it and you know the story is everything that kind of hangs on the plot they say that there's like six or seven you know actual stories what they mean is there's six or seven plots boy meets girl boy loses girl blah 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 mm. um there's only so many ways to to kind of rearrange the plot for something yeah the story becomes about character it becomes about what's being said during the course of the plot. Mm. Um, you know, the plot is, and some movies are very plot heavy and procedural, and some are uh, are super story heavy and character driven. You know, that almost feel like they have no plot. Mm. You watch some uh, mumblecore movies by uh, a filmmaker who I'm super fond of, Joe Swanberg. This, I think, he's uh, uh, kind of one of the great, great. American filmmakers who yeah. um, uh, it, it was part of this kind of mumblecore movement, which came around during the emergence of video. When suddenly, uh, you know, like he was like, "Who cares about how you feel physiologically? You know, receive the information. Grab a camera and go shoot." Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. And that was like one of the first times. I mean, really, it was like there's been multiple instances of it, but it was one of the times when suddenly it became very easy for anyone mm. to grab a camera and go shoot. Yeah. You know, the only time that that really had kind of happened strongly before was shortly after World War II, the camera technology that had been invented, specifically the German camera technology that had been invented, proved to be super, uh, it, it allowed for film, you know, I mean, film stocks had been invented that yeah. were super sensitive to light, and cameras became quiet because if you had a loud Bolex camera, you get shot. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. they know where you are. They can hear the camera, and so they shoot you dead. And the yeah. Germans were like, "Okay, we've we've got to create, a, you know, a silent camera." And so they did, and that camera allowed you know young filmmakers to you know shortly you know in the years that followed the yeah. uh, the wars to basically grab a camera. Guys like Stanley Kubrick were able to grab a camera yeah. and go out like get an Airy two C and shoot. Yeah. And um, that hadn't really happened before. And it kind of allowed for this emergence and this explosion in creativity that we know is like, you know, kind of the 60s and 70s mm. of, uh, of cinema was the people who grew out of, um, you know, the, the advances in technology that took place and the refinements of it that happened in the 50s. And it, it allowed us to break away from studio driven films and into kind of a more immediate form of cinema. And this happened again with the emergence of video, and it will happen again and again and again and 
again yeah. and with other forms of storytelling, cap visual storytelling capture technologies. I can, um, when I'm talking, I can hear like the, like the fascination with cinema. Like I can only imagine the workings that's going on in your brain. Like it's kind of my mind feels exploded just from listening to that. Where did that creative drive come from initially? Like, do you remember a point in your life in an age where you thought, okay, film's what I want to become obsessed with and what I want to live with and what I want to portray and cultivate my life into? Yeah, it evolved, and, um, and I would have to say that it continually evolves for me. Okay, yeah. I am, um, you know, I, uh, I love cinema because, yeah. probably because as I was growing up, it was the predominant art form. Yeah pop art form that you know that existed now one could almost argue that you know video gaming eclipses cinema sure. youtube videos you know uh, or, or sometimes eclipse cinema i mean in certain ways um, you know it's it's something that evolves over time um, I, I began you know when i was uh, when i was young with um, Cartoons like cartooning and uh, drawing art. Yeah, and I was doing lots of um, uh, car cartooning. You know, I was mostly doing visual storytelling, but with uh, you know comics. Mm. And um, that at one point, a teacher, like when I was in grade school, handed me a regular eight camera, which was regular eight was the sixteen millimeter format, literally cut in half. Okay, and so you had um, you know. They would literally just, with a machine, just cut the film in half, and that was regular eight, which had larger sprocketables than Super Eight. And yeah. so um, he gave me this camera, and I used it to begin doing animation. And okay. I was doing kind of very crude cell animation, and it just takes a long time to do because you have to draw a lot. And at a certain point, it just was like, you know what? It's easier to do claymation and three-dimensional okay. um, animation. And so I evolved into that for a while. And I'm, I'm probably talking about over a course of weeks. Yeah. In my mind, <laughs> it's years. But it, this was probably two weeks in my life. <laughs> um, yeah, but in my, in, my, in my adult mind, it was over a much longer experimental period that yeah. I was involved with. <laughs> you messed up clay for a little while, chucked it out. Yeah, exactly. And then eventually yeah. I just was gathering my friends together yeah. and shooting with cameras, you know, movies. Mm. And um, then, uh, like, this was, you know, this is in the 1970s, I mean, understand. And yeah. so, um, you know, I was... Doing like toward the end of the 1970s, I was also kind of getting really, really interested in gaming and okay. the new gaming that was emerging, specifically 8 bit gaming. What was gaming like um, in the 70s? Like, was it wouldn't it have just been Pong? Like, uh, what level well, was it at then? Uh, I mean, my first exposure to it was actually at the Dutch Goose because my family, um, you know, being from uh, the Palo Alto, Menlo Park, Palo Alto area, yeah, um, you know, I uh. We would always go to the Dutch Goose, and What's Dutch, the Dutch, Goose? Dutch Goose was a kind of. I mean, I guess you could say it was a bar, but it was like a sandwich, <laughs> sandwich place, like okay. a hamburger place. Yeah, cool. And so um, we would go there, and they had usually pinball machines. Mm. And one day, there it was, was Pong, okay. and it was you know, uh, I do not have Pong here. Is that the reason for the the arcade machines? The arcade yeah, machines? I mean so the, cool. these are these are the only three that I have. I, I keep. The rest of them at a museum in Pasadena. Yeah, cool. Um, so you collect these? I, I collect and restore them. So you got uh, battle zone. I only collect Atari. Like these are yeah, these are Atari. Yeah. And they're vector machines. So they turn on. Uh, you know, I have I since we just moved and I just moved them. I haven't yeah. turned them on, but I'm sure that they turned them. On. Some of the scan guns might be out of alignment because we just moved. Yeah. And so if I turn them on, they the screen might these these games battle zone battle zone might be able to turn on. Uh, yeah. And work. And work is the other uh, thing. So cool. These games, because most of them are from around 1980, uh, like Gravatar, Battlezone, and Black Widow. I also have um, like uh, a Lunar Lander, which is the first vector game. These don't use raster screens, which are like a normal television. Yeah. These use uh, vector screens, which are like an oscilloscope. Okay. And so um, they, they use a completely different kind of technology, and the monitors... The Wells Gardner monitors for them are extremely touchy, especially the older they get. Yeah. And sometimes also the compa the capacitors tend to, uh, over time, get old and they stop holding their charge. And so sometimes you have to replace the capacitors out of them. But 
We'll try to far, fire up the battle yeah, zone. Yeah, I loved how to go battle zone. It looks yeah. so cool. It's that is you don't see the that very that is the very first first person game. Wow. Yeah, developed by a guy named Ed Rotlane, who is I think a genius, and um, you know was one of the great artists of. Uh, and so I'm like, as visual storytelling goes, to yeah. me, battle zone is an extraordinary achievement. Um, you know, uh, you know, it's it, it's. A completely immersive environment. It's uh, it's VR before VR in yeah. some ways. You're completely inside of this uh, tank experience. You end up, you know, it's full story. There's no plot. You know, you're under some kind of you're under some kind of invasion. I know that, and you're a tank. <laughs> but you might be a rogue tank because there's other tanks, and you can yeah. bring those story elements on your own. I mean, yeah. But you know, to me, these are like very, very pure art pieces. You know, uh, you know, they're they're very basic almost in their design. They're designed like modern art, mm. you know, I think, and so I love them. And so anyhow, yeah, I. Um, I, and I have actually in my garage, I can show you like dozens of Atari 800 computers. What I, made you want to start collecting? I have one in this other room here. Um, it was mostly because I cannibalized those for the parts to put ah. into these because they share the parts. But I first began programming on an Atari 800 8 bit computer. Okay. And, um, you know, when uh, I worked at this video store, Video Archives, and um, actually I worked at another video store called Video Outtakes, and we were. The, one of the owners was leaving and starting up video archives and I went with him and at video archives you know it was sort of like video was new it was like a database of you know thousands of films mm. that said, that hadn't been available before okay. and so the, now in this day and age of torrents and the internet and you know, like kind of instant access to almost everything it seems like maybe like a small thing but yeah. in those days to be able to have a place that you could gather to where like-minded people would come to mm. talk about cinema was a really big deal. It's actually when I worked on Lords of Dogtown, the skateboarding movie, yeah. that's, was my, that was my connection to that movie, which was, I, I mean, also this video store was in the beach city, so I grew up around a lot of surfers but yeah. that was, and skateboarders, but that was besides the point. <laughs> um, the, those guys were gravitating towards Zephyr surfboards because it was what they loved. Yeah. And so they just happened to be around when suddenly the urethane wheel came along. Mm. And it, it just gave them sort of, you know, they were there at the bleeding edge of skateboarding. Mm. And that's kind of what it meant to be able to go and hang out at a video store in those days, which yeah. is you would be around a place, you were looking for, and this is a lot of what Quentin is talking about when okay. he says, you know, that... To be invested it, it in is, you know, Well, it's curation. You, you're, it's, you're, you're being suggested titles by basically a librarian. So would you pitch movies and, to people? Oh, right? absolutely. Okay, it's like a couple Somebody of comes in and they're like, you know what, I'd like to see uh, the latest big movie. And we're like, we don't have it. It's rented out and it's going to be rented out for the next week. Yeah, okay. But we can suggest to you. That's almost beautiful that you can't get it. <laughs> yeah, you can't. I'm sorry, you can't get it. You want that, you go to Blockbuster. Yeah. Um, that's all they Not have. Not a video archive. But, you know, what we can suggest to you is, you know, this awesome Eric Romer movie. Hmm. Or if you're really looking for, you know, a... Uh, um, you know, an action film like that, maybe you should consider one of Jack Hill's black exploitation films. Okay. Those kick ass, and yeah. you might not know that. And so we would, uh, you know, t try to put movies into the hands of people, which were mostly just like Manhattan Beach parents yeah. and, uh, and their children, uh, <laughs> you know, put titles into their hands that they normally wouldn't get a chance to see, yeah. that they, you know, normally wouldn't seek out on their own. And um, maybe that's what's lost in the algorithm mm. that people rely upon for uh, you know Netflix. But I don't know. I don't know. I think the algorithm kind of works. I mean, the algorithm seems to uh, be how most people meet and relate these days. At least it seems that way to me as an outsider. But then maybe someone <laughs> wanted to go out of their out of their genre, like in the sense that we you said like the movie was that so you recommended a completely different genre. And I know like the cool thing is that um that Quentin loves uh, some of his favourite films are Australian films. Those huge sure. films that like I remember one was by this director who made two films ever and then blew his brains out. I can't remember his name. I can't remember films. So it's is an it abstract reference. It's not Richard Stanley, is it? Because he didn't know. blow his brains out. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to be clear He's about still that. He's alive, yeah. Um, um, but like well, they, there's a... I mean, there's... I, I do not know who that filmmaker is. Sure. Um, 
I wonder who that is. That that's actually interesting. I'd love to know. Yeah. Uh, who he's referencing. But that kind of you going out of your genre and sense. Like, what was it like when you were working in the video store? Like, was it was there a point where you were writing Killing Zoe while like Quinton was writing Reservoir Dogs and like there was someone else writing? Something? Yeah, there. That's actually that's exactly what it was like. So there why, was. Yeah, because I'm sure there's been like millions of occurrences where creative people have worked in the same space. Why was it this video store that became this hub for such amazing cinema? Well, at, in those days, there were only a couple of really awesome video stores and okay. most of us were kind of I mean these are all local stores mm. there, this is there this was like this in every big city but um, you know just like there would be certain movie theaters like yeah in LA the new Beverly the uh, but in particular the new art you know okay. the new the new art was just because of the programmer who was running the new art at mm. the time the movies that he would select or she would select you know whoever it was um, the movie that she would select would you know, the movies were you know, always amazing and like really good pairings of double features and had a really good flow. I mean, the programmer was kind of what it was all about. Yeah, there was a, a TV thing called Z Channel, you know, uh, <laughs> when I was young, which was like yeah. this difficult to tune into, almost like Videodrome, <laughs> like you're you're trying to get this channel, but they were showing crazy ass stuff. You could not get anywhere else. You couldn't see it. It was impossible to find. And there was like this one guy who was just basically the genius behind Z channel. And yeah. we used to at video archives, we used to tape things off Z channel, mm. create our own packaging and then rent it to people. <laughs> Is that illegal? Like that I'm sure that that's illegal. <laughs> I I was not the owner of the store, and so it wasn't me that sanctioned you didn't ask it. Questions. it yeah, I was yeah, yeah. just an employee, and it was a very gray area. But if one if one looks at the history of Hollywood, it's yeah. built it's built on theft. There's a, the reason Hollywood so, is in California yeah. at the West Coast is far away from Rochester, New York, yeah. is because it's as far away from Thomas Edison as possible. Okay, and he owned the patent. On the technology. Why is that true? It's... And so they came here, and they knew that they could just they could take his negatives and his prints, oh and they God. would and they would dupe them and release them. And guys like you know the Lamely brothers and yeah. Jack Warner were fucking thieves. <laughs> like those guys were Kim.com in, that, in their yeah. day, and yeah, that's wow. no, that's no joke. They were like stealing uh, stuff and putting it onto the, Did nickel, the public. Into the nickel the Nobody or... cares. Nobody cares today. Do you? Yeah. I mean, most people don't care about, mm. I mean, I'm on a number. Do like, you care? Like, do you care I am someone? on a, uh, an anti-piracy coalition okay. and called creative future. Yeah. And I'm absolutely because it, you know, it, it absolutely has a direct impact and erodes into my, uh, residuals and, uh, yeah. which, you know, sometimes have been, you know, how I survive in thin yeah, years yeah, yeah. and those are going away. But more than, I mean, there's actually also a direct correlation or at least a connection with uh, between piracy and sales. Because I think the people who are pirating tend to also be kind of fetishistic. They also want to own, you know, stuff. And so if they, they're just okay. trying before they buy. Okay, so there's a correlation. And so someone will I, buy pirate and then buy it. I believe that, you know, that there's a kind of symbiotic relationship between pirating and creative uh, products that has always existed. It existed with mixtapes. It existed at video stores where we would like copy, you know, tapes and exchange yeah. them. It never stopped any of us from actually buying material, yeah, okay. subscribing to Netflix, mm. you know, do, do, like do, spending money at movie theaters or whatever else we did. Yeah. It, in fact, it only fueled it because it's what we loved. Mm, yeah, and yeah. so, to me, um, the most difficult thing about being on the uh, on the coalition is that one um, Hollywood, you know, the history of Hollywood is based on theft, mm. and there's like a, a little bit of a d denial for that. Two, the bigger threat in loss of residuals is the fact that everything is moving to a streaming model, and, yeah. and they're purposefully killing uh, DVD technology, yeah. and it is a, a purposeful, you know, um, killing of it. Yeah, and one of the reasons they're doing that is to basically kill old media to create new media. Yeah, okay. New media to, isn't beholden to the same. Uh, residuals contracts with the unions mm. and so you end up not having a uh, um, you end up not having to pay residuals yeah. on new on new stuff you notice though that all the people who are running the tech companies you know, they tend to also be the same board of directors at the big studios mm. they're just moving the model over and so it's a little disingenuous to put all of the blame onto piracy I think piracy is just, you know, it's 
it's just people wanting to have access and to get stuff, and it's hard to get things. I think some young people will view piracy. We make it difficult. We make yeah. it difficult to get stuff. It makes it difficult for me as just like, you know, I don't even fucking own my music anymore because yeah. of Apple, who went through one day and just rewrote over all of my uh, um, recordings and wow. songs because during this kind of transition to the iCloud and delivery on multiple devices yeah, and wow. I, 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 it drives me insane yeah. I completely dropped out of the whole thing because yeah. you know it's like I had all this music I you know I had a certain uh, I had a classical recording and mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I like my classical recordings without Dolby noise reduction because it just chops the waveform off sure. at the top. And um, I want to hear like the creaking of the floorboards and the turning of pages, and I want to hear the ambience in the room when I listen to a classical recording. Yeah. Um, during some iteration of iTunes, Overnight, like all of my recordings got replaced by the sanctioned ones at Apple, and suddenly things, so and suddenly sad. it's like that recording. It's the same song, but it's a different uh, treated piece of it. But you can't do anything. And that happened also with a Harry Nilsson piece that I used in Rules of Attraction, which I can't even find that uh, piece of music so anymore, weird. and that's from my movie. Yeah. And so um, it's, uh, um, I don't know, it's it, it's the way that. That's just the business. The, be the business is actually the most difficult part of the creative. It is show business, and part of it is show, and part of it is business. Yeah, because I'm sure like a lot of people yeah. like who want to break into screenwriting in Hollywood be like curious in like how you went from working to a video store to like breaking. Like I'm sure people would see these like huge people at the gates of production see, companies. See, that is the great lie okay. that's foisted on it's you. It's easy. Well, the trick is to not break in. Okay. I mean, it's a big, it's a big myth that there that you're sold that you have to break into anything that you have to break into Hollywood. Okay. Um, it's like somebody putting a velvet rope in front of a door, <laughs> like it automatically makes you feel excluded, like yeah. you can't go in. But you know, it's an illusion. I mean, it's a complete illusion. The tr the truth is, Hollywood is a nest of ticks that will descend upon you the minute you start making money yeah. or, or creating anything um, creative. Yeah. You know, if you're if you start making something and people are interested in it, mm. believe me, someone, some shady ass dude <laughs> is going to show up, <laughs> make, called an agent or a manager yeah. or a producer or a financier, or like anything like that. They're going to show up and they're going to like you know. They've they've ignored you before, mm. and now all of a sudden they want to like buy you dinner. They want to sleep with you. They want to like make <laughs> your next movie. They want to do whatever yeah. that they never wanted to do before. And okay. that's so the trick is don't try to break in. Yeah, you're not trying to break into anything. You're your own person. You go off and you if you want to make a movie, go make a movie. Well, you did that with cans, and you were killing Zoe. You didn't you fly out cans of no money, and you end up eating like yeah, food yeah. parties and stuff. Like, how did you get that film made? Like, can you talk about that? Well, process? I'm Canadian, and so um, I have a leg up that like a lot of American filmmakers don't have, okay. in, in that Canada supports the cinematic arts, and they, <laughs> uh, you know, by the way, they also support diversity. Okay. And Fifty percent of all monies um, go to women yeah. and to um, uh, to diversity and especially to indigenous people. So yeah. if you're Canadian and uh, you're in any of these uh, um, diversity groups, then you're in a really good place because you have a little bit of a leg up. Yeah. You just have to navigate legally through all of that. And what I did was I basically realized, okay, I'm Canadian. And I found, it turned out there was a group of Canadian producers and they were making a bunch of movies in Canada, mm -hmm. one after another with the same crew. It was like a factory, like a sausage factory. They were just gonna crank the movies out. And they had a bunch of movies all lined up to, uh, um, to go. And I came along and I was trying to get my little bank robbery movie going mm -hmm. that I thought was gonna be an easy film to make and that I was gonna do for like $100,000. Uh, you know, like over time, it kind of ballooned out of proportion, and it became a one point four million dollar movie. Yeah, and you know, budget wise, and one point four was a lot harder to get than a couple hundred thousand. Although mm. any amount of money is difficult to get. So, I, um, knowing that I was Canadian, I basically realized that I fulfilled as a filmmaker, as a writer, and a director, so a certain amount of points that are required to be able to get subsidy money out of the country of Canada. Okay. 
And um, I found these producers who had already worked on the model and they were already doing it and they went ahead and slotted me and they were like, okay, you're film number six and you're gonna use the same crew and we're just gonna crank it out. And I was like, oh my God, I'd never been closer to a movie at all. And they yeah. said, but uh, you've got to um, sell a certain amount of territories. You got to come with like, you know, you have to basically, we've got to back the movie with a certain amount of territories. And so- To get the funding. Yeah, and okay. in those days what you do, what you would do is you would figure out, okay, the, if our budget is, you know, $100 mm. and we can get $45 from the state uh, we need a distribution deal in Canada that's going to bring a certain amount of money to fulfill that, and you need to have a certain amount of pre-sales done. And you try to not sell uh, the United States. You try to not. You try to hold on to the United States yeah. and not sell it because that's usually the big one. Yeah. Okay. The, the difficulty is, is the foreign people, like you know, the little distributors in you know, here, there, and everywhere mm. around the world, they usually only want to buy things that are being bought in the United States. Yeah, and so okay. there's like a little bit of a dance you have to do. And yeah. so knowing this, I like, I, I was like, okay, I've got to sell, I'll go to Cannes. And mm. so I went to the Cannes Festival, I used what little money that we had, and I bought a ticket and uh, got there. I, Monty Hellman, who was a filmmaker, he did Two Lane Blacktop and a movie I absolutely love called Iguana. Yeah. Um, he, uh, he let me sleep on his floor. Wow. And um, it was just like he, you know, I knew him because of Reservoir Dogs. I was going to Cannes. He was like, look, man, uh, you know, I know what it's like. Uh, you need a place to stay. Mm. You know, you can, it's not much, but you can, you know, sleep at the, the place where I'm staying. His family was there and um, he was like, basically opened it up to, you know, struggling filmmakers who yeah. needed stuff to, you know, just were looking to get to Cannes. And so I got there and I proceeded to start to sell. And one of the people I sold to was because there was, I knew there was going to be French content in the movie. Uh, one of the people I sold to was this guy, Samuel Hadida, who I had encountered because of True Romance and that I had written a bunch of work on that and, you know, done rewrites on it for Tony Scott and mm. blah, blah, blah. And um, because of that, I knew Sammy. And so he was like, I'll buy France. And he was literally my first sale. Yeah, okay. And so I was like, okay, like I got... You uh, had no money... I had, well, I had no money. I, I was eating like food hors d'oeuvres at parties to survive because um, like I couldn't afford to eat. It's France. Like you buy a cantaloupe and it's 40 bucks. And you know, it's like, uh, uh, it was, at least in those days it was. So those were the days, there was you no. so sinister at those parties. There was no euro back then. It was only like francs. Yeah. And so, um, so I uh, basically would eat at parties and every now and then somebody would buy me lunch or dinner or something. Mm. And, um, you know, I just slowly kind of put together what I needed to put together. And then, um, Sammy said, Hey, why don't you come to, uh, um, you know, to Paris, I'll introduce you to some of the actors you're interested in. And I was looking at this guy, Jean-Yves Ganglade. Um, I was also looking at, uh, Irene Jacob mm. and a number of others. But I knew that I needed Canadian content, and so I was like, okay, I'm going to have... I was actually thinking about a guy named Jean-Marc Barr, who was okay. Canadian. And he had been in uh, The Big Blue, a Luc Besson film, and I thought, okay, maybe that guy, because then I've got all the Canadian points I need. It's like It was like a formula you, you had to figure that's out. Interesting, yeah. I mean, that's the thing that most people don't realize about a movie, is that when you're making it and you're putting it together, it's a puzzle. Mm. And you have to, like, sometimes make compromises creatively to make the puzzle work or else you just don't make the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so sometimes you have to like figure out how to like slot things in and sometimes it's like, I mean, the classic story that you always hear is like the financier whose mistress uh, <laughs> needs to be the star of the film and you're yeah. like, but the star is a man. And he's like, well, <laughs> rewrite it. And, and she's better at comedy and you're like, but it's a drama. And he's like, yeah, I'll figure it out, kid. I mean, that's kind of, you know, there's always a puzzle and, or you don't have enough money or you can't shoot or it's yeah. raining and you're supposed to shoot outside. Like, you know, there's always something that has an effect on the work. Yeah. And what you're trying to do is you're not trying to make the movie that's in your head as a screenwriter. You're trying to make, you're trying to, like a child, allow it to grow up mm. to become who it's going to become. Mm. You just want to be there to guide it along the way so it doesn't, you know, get a drug habit or, you know, go to prison or, like, yeah. do whatever you can to, like, uh, 
um, to guide it. to guide your yeah, film yeah. and to keep it you know in a in a place where it's kind of sort of creatively in a good zone, but it's going to become what it becomes. Yeah, you know, you think it's going to be one actor, and then suddenly it's somebody else, and maybe it's better with okay. that new person. Like, or you had one idea, like, oh, it's going to take place on a spaceship, mm-hmm. and then you can't do that, and it's like, well, it has to take place in a rainforest, and then that leads you to creative choices and decisions that are maybe better for the movie. And for me, I've always discovered that when I'm rigid, it's a it's usually trouble. When I'm okay. when I'm rigid with the creative process, yeah. it's trouble evolves out of that. When I'm fluid with it and I allow it to bend and I move with it and I take what the universe gives me and uh, you know fold it and cultivate it into mm. the into the work, whatever it is that the universe gives you. But if you're open to it, um, that tends to be the better. Uh, it, it, it tends to work creatively better for me, at least. So was Killing Zoe like an like pretty yeah, close to the visual approximation in your head of what it turned out to be? Um, yes, actually, yes and no. Okay. I mean, it's in some ways it absolutely was. You know, I'd always seen Eric Stoltz. I wrote yeah. it thinking about Eric Stoltz. Yeah. I had just seen, I can't remember what it was, The Water Dance maybe, okay. or something like that, and no one wanted Eric Stoltz at the time. It was like, Eric Stoltz, you know, he's like a ginger. <laughs> like, that would be what they would say now. Nobody actually said that. <laughs> but they were like, you know, he's got red hair, and yeah. uh, you know, there must be someone else. And to me, I was like, dude, Eric Stoltz is the coolest, and yeah. I can identify with him, and he's a great actor. And, uh, um, and actually, he was... At that moment, in uh, in indie cinema, there he was like the king of indie the man, cinema. Yeah. He was literally like the guy who was supporting indie cinema. He was, you know, guys like Noah Baumbach. You know, their career is supported by Eric Stoltz in the very beginning. He's like in their movies, and he's, you know, he he was, seemed like he was he had his fingers into every. That makes it sound bad. He had his, <laughs> he had his, he had his gentle touch yeah. on all New York uh, indie movies at yeah. that time. But um, anyhow, I love Eric, and he uh, working with him, you know, on it was was like uh, it was super lucky that I got him because that it turned out was exactly what I wanted. But over the course of it, like a lot kind of changed, you know, in in my head, mm-hmm. but not so much. There was one moment actually where. Um, because of the nature of the film, I was shooting upstairs and downstairs. We had very little money. And so yeah. um, I had to shoot all of the upstairs uh, first and then go shoot all the downstairs. But in the movie, you're cutting up and down. You're going back and forth constantly. And so if you change something, it has an integral effect on everything else. And it makes it really you know, difficult because you're trying to track people's uh, you know, emotions under pressure during a bank heist you know and go up and down and uh you know manage all these things and if you know and so it made it a little more complicated and the upstairs was all of the big stuff and so we got a little behind okay and the bond company showed up and you always have a completion bond on a movie where they basically pay a certain amount of money to a bond company and then they lord over every dime you spend and make sure that you're not, you know, wasting money, or yeah. that you're not behind. And the minute I was behind, they moved in because they didn't want to have to pay extra money. They were like, okay, you've got to cut pages. Uh-huh. You've got to cut things out of the bank. And I'm like, but what can I cut? I can't cut. Like, yeah. you know, it's, it's, everything connects. And, Jesus, um, yeah. and so I was like, what do I do? And, uh, but I had to cut something. And so I said, okay, I'm going to cut this big shootout down in the basement. There was a moment in the script where the cops try to come in through the sewer. I mean, it sounds ridiculous <laughs> now, but it's like sounds cool. you're a writer, right? You're yeah. like trying to come up with ways in a bank to make it tense. And um, so and the bank that we were shooting at had this like manhole cover okay. in it, and I had written it kind of around the bank. And I thought, oh, I'll have them come up through there, and then I'll have this little shootout downstairs. And then after the shootout, he kills all the cops that were coming up. And then he goes upstairs and he gets on the phone with the, uh, uh, the you know, the negotiator outside. And he says, um, uh, oh, you want to fuck with me? You want to fuck with me? I'll show you who you're fucking with. You, know, you want to do that? I'll show you who you're fucking with. And he goes on and he executes somebody. So I was like, okay, I've got to do something down there. Yeah. And, but I didn't know. But I knew I had to cut. But I had just cut this massive shootout scene that, I yeah. knew that was like a full day's worth of work, yeah. I think. And so I saved a day. So what I did was instead I set the camera up down in the basement 
and I just had the lead actor walk down and Tom Savini, who's like an effects guy, he was like, a, he did all the makeup effects on the original Dawn of the Dead and um, Friday the 13th. Yeah, and cool. he's like, he's like uh, you know, he was actually working on the movie as a favor to me. I called him up because I was such a fan and I was just like, I can't afford to pay you anything. I just love you and I love your work and I would do anything to have you on my film. And, mm. and he was like, oh, I'll pay for myself and I'll, I'll, come and, <laughs> I'll come and work on it. It sounds like fun. And for him, it was just like a fun thing to do. For me, it was like a really, it meant a, it meant a lot. And so Tom taught my actor a little magic trick with flash paper. And I said, I just want you to walk up, you know, and look in kind of, you know, walk into a close up into camera. And then I just want you to basically hear, and we talked about, we talk, we, we had, I always talk very little about what's happening when I'm giving direction to actors. And I talk more about their life and psychology and what they're thinking about in their life and what they're going through. And, uh, and so we talked about things that had nothing to do with the movie actually that, I wanted him to like express on his face like certain emotions and then um but just with like a single like a setup that was just like put the camera here walk up into this shot and he just walked up and he kind of looks around and then he walks back upstairs and then executes everybody and i kind of layered these sounds in and it became instead of just another action scene it suddenly became psychological and it changed the movie completely okay it made the movie infinitely better yeah. Because of because I was forced to cut something because it made me think about how do I you know how do I what how what do I replace it with and then I replace it with something that was psychological instead of action based because it was just cheaper and quicker and easier to do and it saved me a day of shooting mm. and but that little fix changed the character of the of the lead bad guy in a way that kind of deepened him. And made it a little more, um, uh, I, I don't know, it, it, it made it, it just, for me, it just made it a little bit more um, esoteric okay. and, and interesting. And a movie doesn't have to make sense. Mm. And this is what Kubrick always said, is that a movie doesn't have to make sense. It just has to be interesting. Yeah. You know, the audience doesn't need it to, like, track. You don't need to say, I'm going now to the store before you go to the store yeah. and show the store. You can just cut to the store. An audience will fill in the, you know, those... It's like a suitcase in Pulp Fiction. You don't know what's in it. It was always better to not say what's in it. I mean, in truth, the suitcase in Pulp Fiction is the same suitcase in Reservoir Dogs because the stories were all... Really? Yeah, Reservoir yeah. Dogs was once a story inside of Pulp Fiction. Yeah. And then when we decided to make Reservoir Dogs, we just extracted that story out of Pulp Fiction. Yeah. Out of, you know, what that script was... And all the flashback scenes were added to expand it into a into a feature length film, but that briefcase, the DNA of that briefcase is the same DNA of the briefcase in Pulp Fiction. Yeah, it's diamonds, was what originally was in it. But diamonds aren't enough. Diamonds aren't enough to everybody that's out there. Mm -hmm. Diamonds are arguable. Is that good sure. enough to like change your life, to change who you are at the core of your being, mm. like? Is anything enough when you tell an audience what it is? Probably not. To, that will not disappoint them. And so we, we decided, let's uh, not tell anybody what's in there. Let's make it more esoteric. I even think it's too, um, by adding a glow, for yeah. me that was even too much. Okay. I think that it, like, even that was, I, I, clearly it, uh, it wasn't too much because people love it and it absolutely works. But... You know, originally I was just like, let's just not show it. Okay. Let's just not talk about it. Like, let's just have, so when people look into it, there's a moment where he's like, oh my God, it's, uh, it's whatever you want it to be, mm. you know, is, uh, is kind of the, I, I think it's when somebody looks into that briefcase, it is literally whatever they want it to be. Yeah. I think that's the magical quality of that briefcase for me, because that's what we intended it to be. We talk about how um, Pulp Fiction came together in the writing process. Like, were you and Quentin like poor when you were writing this film? And I know you guys went to Amsterdam, which I found surprising. Well, neither of us were poor. Okay. Um, we were. You know, it's not like we had tons of money to throw around. Yeah. Um, we were, you know, working class. You know, my mother's divorced. And, yeah. But, you know, I come from a well-to-do family. It's not yeah. like we're. You know, Quentin's mother, I think, runs a major health company. Yeah. Um, it's not like we. But we were. Um, obsessed and focused on something that um, at the time was like a long shot. I mean, it's not even like we had the tools that we have today 
to you know both interest people you know like using I'm basically talking about the internet but also mm. the all the tools that come with the internet yeah that allow people to really immerse themselves into film as you know uh, storytelling medium and make it affordable and easy to do um, those just didn't exist back then and so you know there was a believe me there was a lot of discouragement like really you know, in, in, into like whether you wanted to become like a you know a filmmaker like who can do that like you know at, in those days it was it was it was a, so it was a big you, dream to have actually even back then so what pushed you into like pursuing it like what was the like was it a part of I just like was better like I guess I never finished the story about the computers yeah. um, I was just better at it there was less math in cinema than there wow. was in computers yeah I was into computer programming I was really into computer graphics. I was mm. studying with Jim Blinn, who uh, was one of the great pioneers of 3D um, uh, filmmaking. He did mm. all of the Jupiter flybys, the Voyager uh, flybys of Jupiter, which had you know um, shading and uh, texture mapping and you know, things like that, like long, in, like long before anybody else was doing it. Yeah, because he was working at JPL and they had you know resources and Evans and Sutherland. These were military companies, basically. Mm. That had access to you know um, computer. Com I mean, I want to say computer graphics, but it's more than computer graphics. It's the you know the full systems that allowed those um, early computer graphics to be done, and uh, and so I had all sorts of access as a kid, and I'm not even sure why. Um, I had ac actually, as I think about it, like. <laughs> How did I even have it? I, like, it's kind of weird. It's like my mother had a boyfriend because yeah. my parents were divorced, and yeah. then through Hughes and aircraft, and then through them, Evans and Sutherland, and that allowed me to have access to see uh, kind of where computer graphics was going. Like yeah. long before these are in the days when some computer graphics were being done through analog wow. techniques, and so. Um, uh, so, so I started work early on in CPM systems and was writing uh, uh, like early, early software, mostly on 6502. Um, but at this point, the filmmaker dream, what it was like at the back of your mind or just didn't exist? Well, no, it was something that I was doing in animation at that time and then, you know, films with my friends. Mm. And so I was doing a little bit of both. And okay, to, me, to, to me, they were complimentary. I mean, I was using them also as complimentary. Yeah. Uh, I was also really, I mean, this is going to sound strange to talk about in it, but I think it did have an effect back then. I was really into Dungeons and Dragons, which is a kind of role-playing, immersive, rule-based uh, gaming system pre, you know, kind of, kind of almost like video games before video games because they were so complicated, but they're also storytelling and world building. Mm. And you would build entire worlds and dungeons and adventures and campaigns for people to go on and then guide them through it. And so really that gave me the foundation of talking to actors yeah. and trying to describe visually kind of something that I wanted, uh, you know, um, something that I wanted someone to experience. And so I think I would fold those tools eventually later on and just start using them. I mean, it was like, you know, you become a composite of uh, all the, um, you become a composite of all the influences that, mm. that kind of land upon you as you're, you know, growing up, I guess, is the, the way to, <laughs> yeah. the way to put it. And so, so the gold watch storyline that you wrote in Pulp Fiction, I know you've talked about that, um, your experiences are, and like your writing is a reflection of your past. What part of you went into that storyline of the gold watch? Um, I mean, everything and nothing. You know, okay. it's, uh, it's uh, you know, I've never robbed a bank, but <laughs> the character of Zed in Killing Zoe, it's very close to me. Yeah. Um, I just did a movie called Lucky Day yeah, yeah, with yeah. Uh, this guy, Luke Bracey. He's basically, he's kind of playing me um, in that also, even though I'm not him in mm. any way. The guy's like a bank, you know, he's a, he's cracks safes and uh, both of them actually are safe crackers and, yeah. and um, but metaphorically, just like how Beowulf may not be about an actual superhuman, uh, you know, godlike uh, hero, he might just be a real guy mm. who, you know, some extraordinary shit happened to. <laughs> and um, the story gets told about him differently. You know, same thing 
I think with me or with anybody. Mm. Um, I don't know. That's a... Uh, did I answer the question? <laughs> I don't. Need, I don't know if I answered it. How much of your, I guess your your experience went into the writing that you did in, I guess, particularly pop fiction, but maybe all your past work, because it's just such an, um, I, even from like an Australian perspective, it's such an iconic film that kind of like just kind of like screams, "This is America" type thing. So I'm wondering if like even when you're at the table writing it, whether you thought that would turn into the iconic work it did, or whether you whether you thought anything would pulp come fi- of it. Pulp or... fiction, working on pulp fiction. Yeah. No. Um, when we worked on Pulp Fiction, uh, we were, I mean, first of all, we were like hired by a studio. To, so on one hand, yes, okay. it was a big difference. Uh, Quentin at that time had just done Reservoir Dogs. And, um, and so he was like kind of an indie, people were very interested in, mm. in, you know, in him. People were interested in me. People were interested at that time in anybody in indie film who was doing something kind of a little, you know, I mean, indie film was emerging, you know, largely because of uh, home video and DVD as a kind of viable revenue stream for, like I said, you know, they come to you. You don't, yeah. you don't go to them. Yeah. It's like not like you break in, you just do it, and then mm. suddenly they show up. And okay. um, Reservoir Dogs actually made less money than Leprechaun. The, Which is, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, the Warwick Davis movie. Yeah. And uh, that movie was like a, a bona fide hit in the United States. In Europe, on the other hand, people knew who Reservoir, you know, people, they didn't differentiate back then, you know, like a big American movie and a small American movie. It was just an American movie that yeah. would show up. And, uh, and so in Europe, it was like a big, like it was crazy. Yeah. Like people didn't. Well, it did it, amazingly at the festivals. It, it, it did really amazing. And yeah. so he had a lot, of, a lot of opportunities and he went back to Pulp Fiction, which is a project we had long talked about doing as a, a film with, you know, like a bunch of short films that we would put together with various filmmakers and wanted to do it himself. And so we got hired by TriStar to develop that, the screenplay based on what Quentin wanted to do next. Mm. And, um, but, you know, Pulp Fiction, I mean, for, again, for us, it was huge. It was like making a $100 million movie. But back then, Pulp Fiction was an $8 million movie. I mean, Reservoir Dogs cost one point three, one two, one three, I think, yeah. around there um, in 1993 dollars. And uh, you know, Pulp Fiction cost eight you know, in whatever, whatever, whatever that was, 1994 dollars, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whatever year that was. And so it's, uh, um, it, it was a huge amount to us. Mm. Like it made a big difference. Like suddenly the production was huge. Uh, but really in the grand scheme of things, it was still a small film. I mean, it was a small, hip, cool movie you know, when Bruce Willis attached himself to it, it took it to another level. Yeah, so even with the I amazing think. cast, it wasn't apparent that it was going to turn into this No, I remember one interview Bruce Willis did on MTV where he, um, they were asking him, what are you doing next? It was like, you know, after some Die Hard movie or yeah. something like that. And he was kind of trying to explain to them that he was doing a small film. And he looked sheepish about it, and he was trying to, like, he was kind of throwing out Quentin's name. Nobody really knew. I mean, people in tight circles knew who he was. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, there was an art house crowd who was sort of, you know, the same people who knew who John Woo was. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. You know, in, in those days, or knew John Woo's work before he came to Hollywood. Um, you know, there, there was a lot of excitement among those people, but mainstream didn't know who he was. And so here's Bruce Willis, who's like the mainstream guy, and he's describing uh, you know, what he's going to do next. And I remember him being like a little, yeah, he's got Quentin Tarantino. Like he didn't really know yet how to frame it because there was no framework yet for that kind of, uh, mainstream indie experience. Mm. And, um, didn't try star say it was the worst script they'd had handed to them. Uh, I mean, yes, in a general way, th- there was a great amount of disappointment in the script when we turned it in. Do you it, find that surprising retrospectively? Uh, I mean, Mike Metavoy, who was running TriStar at the time, I think found it surprising, um, at, you know, retroactively. Mm, <laughs> you know, yeah, he, yeah. He, um, he was one of the few people who approached me afterwards. And he was like, you know, I was wrong. I, um, you know, and I love Mike. He's, I think he's a brilliant guy. He's actually made 
some of my very favorite movies of all time. I think the guy's a freaking genius. Yeah. One of the best producers ever, or like one of the best studio heads ever. Orion was one of the great companies, and his choices were some of the best. And, you know, just when the script came in, he was like, look, it was super violent. It was long, and it was long. Um, and it was violent. And the violence was, like, super described. And it, the humor may have been encoded more mm, into it, it's like, more yeah, difficult yeah. for someone to extrapolate, like, what it means. And then, plus, you're reading it, and maybe it's one of your weekend reads, and you've got, like, you know, six scripts to read, and one of them's by Jonathan Demme, and the other one's by Terrence <laughs> Malick. And, you know, and you've got this Quentin Tarantino. Like, you don't know what, what it is, and, like, you're going through it, and nothing makes sense. Yeah. And, you know, like... I don't know what his first impression was, but you know it happens to people, and so you know there was like a kind of tide in the room of uh, you know of uh, apprehension. Uh, well, just turnaround. It was that's yeah. what that was sort of the it was safer probably just to put it into turnaround. Again. Yeah. And then Harvey and Bob came along and they got it and yeah. they swept in and gave Clinton the support he needed. Yeah. And you know. Um, the rest is history. Yeah, we have Pulp Fiction. And um, and along the way, you know, it, it helped to have the machinery kind of pushing it. I mean, there was this real, the machinery of Hollywood. There was this real understanding of, um, you know, that there's something kind of new and exciting happening in cinema and that home video is allowing this to happen. Mm. That this is the home video generation. Yeah. Just like you know, we've since had an, sort of an internet generation of influence in visual storytelling, and uh, you know, and how to monetize uh, creative storytelling. Yeah. And, you know, and uh, that was the one back then. And so, as people realized that, there was a great amount of support, you know, from agents and yeah. You know, so, like, you know, it was it was almost like. I, I suppose destined to happen that there would be this kind of uh, um, groundswell for that kind of um, cinema at that time, um, but it wouldn't have happened without the support of you know the business. Yeah. And yeah, the yeah. Re and the realization of hey guys, there's money to be made here. Yeah. And it built uh, Miramax as a as a studio at yeah. that time. I mean the the success of that film. It's I mean I I kind of figured the movie would you know do halfway well we always kept our budgets low and that movie for what was going on in it you know was made for like a, a really good price and that kind of fit the formula if you make something that's like you know good and kind of delivers and makes people feel something and uh you know and you do it you know for a relatively cheap price mm. and then it has the support and backing of the you know the, the machinery of the business. I mean, you can really, um, you know, uh, that, that, that's what, it's what we have to thank for. I don't know the nine explosion of cinema in the nineties. Finally, um, you've come back. I, I, I should also say, I mean, I got. I'm putting it all on Pulp Fiction, but I should really, <laughs> I should really like you know, kind of also point to Sex Lies and Videotape, yeah, okay. and you know, the the big influencer. At least for, I mean, for, for really, I think I, I mean to say for both of us, for a lot of people, was also Spike Lee at that time. Yeah, sure, yeah. Who yeah. was out of nowhere, you know, just grabbing a camera and, you know, making it. Yeah. And just, you know, full energy. And that is that was huge. That was huge. And so, and also there were other movies doing similar storytelling techniques coming out simultaneously to mm. Pulp Fiction. You know, Jim Jarmusch did Mystery Train at that time, which was multiple storylines. I mean, people never talk about that film, but it's uh, it was a huge influence on Pulp Fiction. You've got three storylines. They're all interconnected. There's a gunshot that kind of connects them all, so you can kind of set your time, you know, in within each story based yeah. on the gunshot that happens in the you know in the background, and and so you can use you know, and it, so it's like a fascinating uh, little film. There was also uh, Christoph Kieslowski's uh, Three Colors movies mm. that came out around then, Red, White, and Blue, uh, or Blue, Rouge, and uh, Blanc. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and each of those movies is connected. You, yeah. you can see the actresses from and, and players from one film inside of the other, and they're all these kind of interconnected movies. And so mm. it was kind of an idea whose time was coming, the structure of the film, but it, it was...
The bullet shots in I was want to ask the bullet shots that um the miracle bullet shots that miss um Samuel Jackson in that film. How did that idea come about? Because when my dad first showed me Pulp Fiction, I think I was like twelve years old or something. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm so sorry. I apologize. <laughs> Jesus. When I first saw it, like even like obviously being super young, it's still like it jumped out as being, you know what I mean? Like because it, it's again like was that thing like well how did they miss? It's kind of like and then for, like the next time it was twelve year old me was like well how did they miss? Like they were right there. Like where did that like that idea feels like it's something like it's just such a novel idea that wouldn't not many people would think about that. I actually wrote that that specific scene. Mm. I wrote that for True Romance actually. Wow, that okay. was the scene with Dretzel. And um, in Dretzel's apartment, and you know, there's this. There was this whole moment in True Romance that you don't see in the movie, obviously, because those scenes were cut out yeah. and moved into Pulp Fiction. Mm. And um, there's a whole scene within it with uh, Dretzel and the bullets and the yeah. marketing and the gun going off in the car and blowing yeah. off Marvin's head. Yeah, yeah. Um, all of that was in you know the whole thing about you know flock of seagulls and. All of that was for uh, True Romance. Were you worried about the violence in the film? No. Not at all? No. Not then. Yeah. No, not then. I mean, now I, you know, it's like I'm a different person now, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but no, I wasn't really, I mean, I don't know if I was worried about it. I, yeah. There was a huge discussion at the time about uh, um, violence in cinema. And I think I made some statement on a on a BBC special mm. at one point that I'm almost a little ashamed of because it just got misinterpreted, but it also, I got thrown to the wolves a little bit over it. And it was, um, I said something like, look, I'm, I'm not a moralist. It's not my job yeah. to like lay morals onto everything. I'm, you know, that's, it's not what I do. Mm. I'm not trying to like, you know, m you know, be a moralist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and David Putnam, who is like one of my heroes, and I actually feel really bad about it because I like, you know, I think after Mike Metavoy that he might be my favorite studio executive okay, of yeah, all time. Yeah. And maybe Bill Mechanic shortly after that. <laughs> like they're they're all in contention. They're it's, it's all very close. These are all really super brilliant guys. Mm. But David Putnam, he was like he basically picked me out of an out of like a documentary full of people, like saying volatile stuff yeah. and basically said that kid should be taken out and shot for what he's just said about uh, um, you know because it's careless and I get what he's saying I kind of understand what he's saying but you know I mean he made one of my favorite anti-violent films of all time he made a number of movies that are my favorite anti-violent films mm. and I'm actually like against I mean the difference between Quentin and I I think is that um, and this was always the case is that you know Quentin he, he loves the cinematic device of revenge okay. in a movie revenge is one of the things in a film that you know it's, it's, it's been around since early early cinema and it will be around forever it's one of the most exciting devices for you know to push a, a story along mm. is a revenge plot I kind of like, for, I'm a big on forgiveness. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, and yeah. so, you know. So is that a dispute? Like when you are. Uh, there, well, yes and no. It's like everything is a dispute. When, yeah. you, when you're writing and you're creating and you're yeah, working yeah, together, yeah. every conversation you have mm. is a, it, I mean, it's, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a, maybe dispute is the wrong term, but every conversation is a creative dialogue mm. that you have to discuss uh, motivations of people and what's more important for somebody and you know is revenge more important or is forgiveness more important you know is the better quality of humanity more important or is the more salacious quality of humanity more important and it always depends on the tale that you're telling you know um, the for me the revenant and um, oh my god what's the one on the on the Mars, the the Martian, the Revenant and the Martian, which are two movies that came out in the you know same year and were competing yeah. against each other. To me, they're almost identical movies. Okay, yeah. They're men in extreme situations where nature is absolutely yeah. against them, yeah, yeah, yeah. doing everything that they can to survive inside of it. One is motivated by revenge, yeah, and the other one is motivated by just survival and humanity. And one movie is about humanity coming together, yeah, and the other one is about I'm gonna fucking kill it. <laughs>
And there is definitely an audience favorite among yeah. the two of those. And it's, it's more difficult to tell The Martian, I think, as a story than it is to tell um, The Revenant. Mm. Even if The Revenant is like, you know, I don't know, a funner movie to watch because it's, you know, more, I don't know, intense or salacious or whatever. And potato farming is less interesting, you know, <laughs> cinematically maybe. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I kind of appreciate them. As, and maybe this is just me as an older, uh, an, as an older man now talking, but mm. you know, I appreciate The Martian these days okay. more. And I think David Putnam was probably more in that headspace yeah and it's the job of a young filmmaker actually to like go out there and kind of push button and do things you know uh you know to to go places that people aren't normally going to yeah you know, you're not, your job isn't to be a moralist when you're young your job is to be a moralist when you're older maybe sure yeah yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know? um when you're young you, you know it's like when you look at I don't know, riots mm. or whatever. You see the police on one side and the, the mob on the other. In the middle tends to be like kids mm. with rocks, like yeah, throwing yeah, yeah. rocks because, you know, they're the, they're the ones who, you know, who react the and, masses, and yeah. do without, uh, you know, because, you know, maybe experience t- teaches you over time and yeah. holds you back. So, I don't know. I... Um, with the whole David Putnam thing, he's probably long forgotten about it. It yeah. affected me in a really big way at, That's the, interesting, at yeah. the time because, um, you know, like Bugsy Malone, for example, just to pick one of the movies he made, is um, such an important movie to me and it's such an important movie that's like an anti-violent film. It's a movie against violence. Mm. And, um, you know, I like, I've made movies that are violent films, but I'm actually at my core kind of against violence as a as an action. So is that a tension I'm also, in your I'm, psyche? I'm, well, no, I'm also against, okay. you know, like I don't do heroin. And <laughs> like there's all this heroin in the movies I've done. Yeah, you know, because yeah, when yeah. I was growing up, which was around the 70s, you know, there was movies, like heroin was everywhere. Heroin was the big, dark, scary thing. It wasn't okay. like whatever there is now. Um, God, what is the, like, whatever the new drug is. Probably ecstasy. Even, no, ecstasy. God, that's like the 80s, Coke, the 90s. That's like... <laughs> MDMA, is that part of ecstasy? Yeah, MDMA, that existed before. That was, MDMA okay. is the uh, the original uh, chemical combination that was used when MDMA was a, uh, kind of used to pacify insane people. Uh, <laughs> used to, yeah. Um, so okay. in, anyhow, um, uh, so w- w- heroin at that time in the 1970s, it, maybe it was because it was like after Vietnam. Yeah. And there was like all these junkies coming back and like suddenly, you know, heroin addiction was in cinema and it was like Panic in Needle Park and Who'll Stop the Rain. And it was like all this like heroin, 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 the dark, scary uh, drug that you can never recover from. Mm. And, uh, you know, and just the optics of, you know, growing up in the 70s. Uh, which was like, you know, sort of the idealism of the 60s gone bad. Mm. Um, it kind of, it, it was just so present as uh, something that was as far as, you know, you could go. Yeah. Which is obviously not the case you later discover. And so it became, when you're making a movie where, you know, you're throwing elements in which are meant to be as far as you can go. Yeah, Heroin yeah, yeah. suddenly just became a thing. Yeah. You know, that, uh, you know, was an element in the films. It was something to uh, explore and, you know, shamelessly explore. But with the moral <laughs> side of, like, screenwriting and, like, when you were with a writing partner, like, did you find that as, like, a kind of checks and balances thing? Like, someone, like, maybe... Quentin says something stupid, he says something stupid, and the one said, that's not going in the film. Like, was it kind well, of... Well, yeah, there's less of that than there is actual role-playing and talking yeah, okay. beforehand. Like, the, the idea of coming up with the idea of the pantomime, mm. which is not a real thing, doesn't exist, but exists inside of True Romance, that happened while Quentin and I were driving on the 405 freeway through the Sepulveda Pass. Uh, we were just basically role-playing and talking through... Um, the scene and what somebody would, uh, you know, use to be able to tell if somebody lied. 
And so we came up with the idea of pantomimes and that men have a certain amount of pantomimes and women have a certain amount. Like men, you know, and like that uh, if you know these pantomimes, then you can, uh, you know, basically tell if somebody's lying, it's better than a lie detector. This came out of a conversation that we had and we okay. were like, ooh, that, sh that would go perfect in that yeah. scene. There was much more of that than arguments and, um, you know, over, hey, this sucks or that sucks. Yeah. Or, I mean, sometimes, you know, you're like... Uh, like an early conversation was because I had written the gold watch and the conversation was, God, that's kind of like such a, you know, like a, um, what do you call it? Like a, a MacGuffin or a, a red herring. It's such a red yeah. herring. It has nothing to do with anything and yet it motivates everything mm, inside okay. the story. And so it's like, you know what, what we need. And, and that came out of that kind of sucks as a device. Yeah, okay. Because, you know, oh, I, my watch, I've lost it. I've got to go get it. Unless you make that watch have the most important past yeah. possible, yeah, yeah. and so you have Father to, Sunday. so you have to like increase the volume on that watch to the extent that it becomes more than a watch; it becomes a metaphor mm. for the character. Yeah, and that comes out of discussions of God. That's not enough. Like that's not good enough. The briefcase being empty and not having diamond, or not being empty, but not showing what's in the briefcase. Yeah. that comes out of those kind of conversations. But those, you know, tend to mostly be like, God, that doesn't really work. Like, what can we do? What can what can be better? And and sometimes you don't solve it right away. And you think about it, and you're driving on the 405, and you're having a conversation, and then you're like, Ooh, that works really well. Yeah. And so you put it in. So it sounds like, how come you two never came back together if you had that magic writing with one another? Um. I, that's a that's occur. probably a good question. Uh, the the honest answer, if I'm really like being honest, is um, you know the business kind of got in the way, yeah, and the dynamic okay. and the dynamic of our friendship changed. And our friendship, you know, when I see Quentin, um, when I do see him, and the last time I saw him was at the Scream Awards. Um, you know, it's it's like seeing a brother. It's he's we spent our formative years together mm. and he's uh you know a dear person to me and so you see him and you hug and it's like how are you and it's good to see you but we're different people now mm. and then and we're not too you know it's one thing when you're just two guys working in a video store trying to write scripts and trying to get movies mm. made and doing stuff and it's another thing when you add all the other elements of the business that change the dynamic of a friendship and so we I think at a certain point it just became a conscious decision or maybe even a subconscious decision of let's just let our friendship be our friendship okay, and yeah, not yeah. let it be, uh, um, you know, contorted by the limbo of the business, yeah, you know, yeah, by yeah. The, the game of limbo <laughs> of the business. It's weird like five, eight years ago that um, idea of the prequel for Pulp Fiction was like chucked around in the press a bit. Did that just come out of kind of nothing? Was it kind of like that? Well, was we've like... all—I've always known what the sequel to Pulp Fiction is, or what the prequel is. I yeah. mean, we, those conversations we've had, like, okay. you know, I know exactly what it is. If they do a yeah. Pulp Fiction series, I'm probably a good guy to come to because, yeah. uh, you know, I have all the documents from the development of the yeah, um, of project, yeah, and yeah. so you know, it's like uh, that would be kind of cool. However you know is it needed and you know there's already a kind of universe by which all of these characters mm, live yeah yeah you know sort of the i mean it's a tarantino verse you know, and i have like a little like you know subcontinent of, in the tarantino verse <laughs> <laughs> you know along with a couple of other filmmakers who have collaborated with him in the past yeah and um uh you know i, I don't know what, what can one, what can one say about that so you know we just never um, you know, came back to work together. Mm, you know, I've yeah. worked with other people and it's always been, uh, um, you know, kind of a similar pleasurable experience. Like, you know, I've written with Neil Gaiman, mm. uh, the novelist, and we had a very, very similar, very close, um, connected writing experience, which mm. was super enriching. I mean, that's, you know, when, when you have any relationship with anyone, you kind of carve out a little piece of yourself yeah. to make space for the little piece of them that you fill in that hole with. And then you give it a little piece of yourself to them. And it, that's a, excuse me, my God, like a proper, <laughs> uh, a proper sharing experience. Yeah. And um, when a relationship is imbalanced is when somebody, you know, kind of gives up a little piece of themselves yeah. and they don't get anything back. Yeah. And 
I've been fortunate enough throughout my career to have a number of writing partners that I always have good experiences with. I've worked mm -hmm. with Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio. Those guys were fantastic to write with and to, to work with. They're dynamic and fun thinkers and uh, they have great ideas and they really have a, um, they're super dedicated to the, the actual practice of the craft. Um, you know, Neil Gaiman is, you know, share brains with the, you know, somebody like that and mm. they automatically become your brother for life. Yeah, yeah. You can go years without seeing them or maybe it's like somebody you were in combat with that you see them years later, decades later, and you're like, oh my God, we were in the foxhole together. Mm. And it was such an intense experience that it galvanizes your friendship yeah, in a way yeah. that, you know, you can go for very long periods of time, at least for me, without seeing somebody. Mm. And, um, you know, then when you see them again, it's like, yeah, we shared a piece of our brain together. Um, these days, I write with my daughter, who, mm. um, you know, actually for the last... God, seven years or so. Oh, wow. um, she's been my writing partner, and we write almost everything together. We develop projects together. We go on pitches together. She's my director of development and does all of my, uh, um, you know, like I don't, nothing, you know, happens without going through her. Yeah. And um, because she's tough, she's smart, she's fast, um, and it's a completely different kind of experience. I mean, so for me, you know, it's like I've, Worked. I've had a number of really, really good writing partners, but I, you know, this is one that I made myself. Yeah, yeah. And I, tr and I trust <laughs> literally, yeah. literally, and I trust, <laughs> I trust her like absolutely, like yeah. know, she, I like has my back, and I can absolutely, and and so you're kind of like asking about moral checks and balances. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, in the writing, you know, yeah. she is different than me. She is a girl. She's you know in her early 20s she yeah. is uh you know um we share a lot and when we write sometimes you know the writing blends and you can't tell who wrote what mm. at a certain point but she definitely has a distinct voice that is her own she is you know a girl and can speak you know uh with confidence through you know a certain facet of her voice that I can't do yeah. without it being false yeah I do a certain thing that you know she doesn't do maybe precisely and you know from the other end and together it makes for a good combination and maybe it's changed some of the you know the work that um, that I've done a little bit yeah but I think only in a healthy way it's usually you know adding um, you know, kind of uh, processing cycles. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not, yeah, yeah. It's not subtracting processing cycles. Yeah. It's, it tends to be, you know, the one thing that I would say that she's done for me that was really important at that stage in my career was, um, uh, you know, when, how do I put it? When you're young, you, um, you just do. You remember, like, I talked about those people who just, like, when they're young, they just run out and they throw rocks at the... Yeah, at the place. Whatever, you know, they're, they're just, they're acting. Yeah. You just do. And the metaphor in writing of running out there into the no man's land and throwing rocks at the police is just letting it pour out of you without yeah. monitoring what you're doing. Yeah. Without really focusing on, like, limiting yourself or... Um, inhibiting yourself or governing your your inner voice mm. let it speak and it just pours right out of you and then you look at it and and you just write and you know i'm, I'm super into the surrealists and the surrealist movement and uh I'm part of marilyn manson's uh church and uh of, of <laughs> for realism yeah. and and all of that and so i'm really really into um automatic writing yeah and working with her made me kind of remember What's important because the older you get, the more you, um, with the more experience you have, and the mm. more, um, uh, you know, the more, well, the more experience you have, yeah, the more caution you you end up using. The more, you know, the more cautious you are because the the more you second guess everything okay. that you do. Yeah. 
And so working with her has reminded me that when you're young, you just let it pour out. Yeah. You don't say, oh, I wonder if this is the best thing for the characters to do in this moment. Let's mm. think about it. Let's talk about it. Let's workshop it. Let's you know put it up on the board and map out the entire script and figure it out. No, you just let it happen. You just let it pour out of you because you feel somewhere deep inside of you, outside of your conscious mind, it pours out of you. And when I was young, when I was writing, what I would do is I would kind of wait for the tunnel to appear before me. And I would kind of wait for this sort of, and it still happens, where you wait for the tunnel to appear and then you watch the movie inside of it. And you just try to like transcribe what you're listening to yeah. as fast as possible. You're basically listening to the voices in your head and allowing schizophrenia to occur so that you can, uh, so that you can surprise yourself with what you're writing. And yeah. sometimes you know, I'll look back on what I've written and I'm like, where the hell did that come from? Is that me? Okay. Is that me at my deepest self? I don't know. Okay. You know but you know, So working with her again reminded me of automa the automatic writing as a, as a kind of conduit into you know, your, your subconscious and letting whatever you write just kind of pour out of you and splash on the page because when you're writing, faster is better than better. Yeah. Does that make sense? That makes sense, yeah. Faster yeah. is better than, like, people don't actually, in Hollywood, when you're writing a script and you're, like, you know, you're, you're hired, you're contracted by Warner Brothers or Paramount or Sony or somebody like that, they want you to rewrite a script and mm. they give you, they send you the pages and you get it. And they actually don't want it good. They just want it now. That's interesting. Like they yeah. want it sooner than better. Yeah. Like they would There's rather. A flow in there. Most people would rather have more steps, you know, when they're developing because they just want it done. Yeah. And so what you know, and 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 that's actually the hardest thing to do because you know, to just do it and then just give it to them is is actually more important because you know, people want it yesterday, and so it's actually kind of helpful. For that, for that business facet of it, mm. and also creatively, it allows you to surprise yourself, which yeah, is what yeah, you're yeah. always trying to do. Yeah. At least for me, it's what you're trying to do. I'm not really one of these writers who likes to map it all out and figure it all out mm. and know exactly when so and so is going to walk through the door. Yeah. I like to just, you know, oh my God, the, none of the bullets hit him. Yeah. Oh my God, the gun just went off and blew off Marvin's face. Okay. So it's a surprise to you when that, that comes I, out. I didn't know the gimp was coming out of the box when I wrote it. Yeah. Suddenly the yeah. gimp came out of the box. Yeah. Like the, <laughs> the gimp just suddenly, they were unbolting it and they opened it. I didn't even yeah. know what was in it as they were unbolting it. And wow. then they threw it open and inside was the gimp. Yeah. And I don't know where that came from. Yeah. It was not, uh, you know, a planned thing. It yeah. just happened somewhere in your psyche those little gimp the somewhere box. the gimp came out <laughs> and and the, the trick for me was just to allow the gimp to come out yeah and to allow it to come out you can't plan for it to come out it mm. just has to come out yeah, yeah and yeah. that's for me the hardest thing about the creative process in writing yeah. is to get to the place where you can allow them to happen and um where you're not like caring so much about what somebody else is going to think mm. or am i going to is this scene written in a way that you know the business wants it to be yeah you yeah, know yeah. Is, th is this like how a movie should happen yeah you know, does the hero do this at this point you know is this the time for reversal or is this the time for you know uh you know to invert the expectations of the character or to do this or to do that and you know what does uh the sid field say that we should do or something like you know mm. the, the book on screenwriting or whoever that guy is who does all the screenwriting classes, <laughs> you, know, um, you know, rather than to map it out, to just kind of... Go on instinct. Go on instinct and yeah. watch the movie. Yeah. You can figure out all that other stuff in rewriting. Yeah. You know, just... But in your initial process, it's the most pure form of the process for me. I mean, there's two things that are super pure about the filmmaking process. One is the act of writing because you are mostly alone even when you're writing with a partner, they tend to be writing something. Like when I write with Gala or when I wrote with Neil Gaiman, mm. we would trade off on scenes. You're going to write this, I'm going to write this. And then we would write it and then we would swap it. Okay. And then that person would rewrite what you did and you'd rewrite what, rewrite what they did. Yeah. And that became a very pure way of doing it because you work alone and you work together. And you end up making discoveries along the way that kind of change what you did. And it's a very, it's a, it's a very pleasurable way to write. Um, 
but even still, you know, I, I have to like, I, I like, I, I prefer to just let it happen. Yeah. I tend to know where people are going in general when I write. So, but, so lucky day. Mm -hmm. Why have you come back and made, like, was there an, an urge and was it on InSync? Like, what's the reason for the, direct, the directorial comeback, writing the script? What was it that inspired you to, what part of your life, and that's kind of been the narrative that's run through this, that's cultivated Lucky Day? I was in jail and um, I was basically locked to a desk with a golf pencil and mm. sheets of paper. And um, I told, I asked myself, you know, I wonder if I should, uh, um, you know, just let myself go and write a kind of '90s movie again, basically in the same universe and with the same characters, you know, that have kind of populated Killing Zoe, mostly Killing Zoe, but there's, I mean, all, of, you know. There's also characters in this that are referencing other characters in other films that are, I mean, it's, like I said, it's a subcontinent of the, maybe not even a subcontinent, maybe just an, an island chain. Yeah. <laughs> an, ar an archipelago <laughs> of the Tarantino-verse. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, but in there, there are connections to all these movies that I've been involved yeah. with. And it was, I think, maybe a way for me to connect back to those films you know, there were bits of true romance in it, bits of Killing Zoe, bits of Pulp Fiction. I mean, there's bits of characters that I had, you know, I mean, the Beatrice character mm. in uh, Kill Bill uh, has a kind of piece in this. Like, there's little bits of everything, yeah. in, you know, in this film. And it was more because I was in this kind of confined environment where you're, 23 hours in lockdown mm. and you're surrounded by you know uh, got neo-nazis to one side yeah, and mexican Jesus. mafia to the left yeah. and you know you're just trying to like uh stay inside of your own world yeah. and at the same time uh take in the influences that you're experiencing and that you're listening to all around you and cultivate it into that work i mean you know uh, Quentin uh, also when we did just before we did True Romance went to jail and um, he was I think in jail for like a week but during that time he had some great dialogue came okay. out of that it was like you know you ever cook your crack with cherry seven up pussy love pink rock like that's a real <laughs> line of dialogue yeah, wow. that came out of uh, Los Angeles County yeah. uh, jail yeah. and so um, you know you, you basically have to carry a pad of paper with you wherever you go and you write down things like this and that environment happens to be pretty good for writing a crime story and so it kind of poured out of that experience and then those pages I would send because they would confiscate my pages out of uh, um, you know when they would raid cells mm. they would take you know try to get people like contraband from people like Shanks and Pruno, okay. which is yeah. jail wine or tar heroin. But for me, they would take whatever I wrote. Yeah. And so I realized that if I sealed envelopes and uh, sent them out, they wouldn't open up yeah. my mail. Yeah, yeah. They weren't allowed to open mail. And so I would send uh, the pages to my daughter and then she would write, type them up for me and write them. And basically that's how the script was developed. And do you think that was something that kind of kept you through that experience, like the creative outlet of writing the script? The creative outlet of writing in general was super important to me. Yeah. I mean, when I was there, my all my writer friends and filmmaking friends, uh, you know, like my DP sent me a copy of uh, Dostoevsky's House of the Dead, yeah. uh, which is Dostoevsky writing about his experiences in a gulag yeah. in the eight, late 1800s. And, you know, Dostoevsky was scheduled to be executed and then was sent to a gulag instead. Yeah. And he writes about his experience, and what was fascinating to me was it was exactly what I was experiencing yeah. at that same yeah. time. Um, and that's the power of stories, I guess. You know, Cervantes wrote uh, um, Don Quixote yeah. uh, while in prison. Um, and so, like, Neil Gaiman would send me, like, Don Quixote. And he's like, oh, you know, here you can see, Roger, that you know, even Cervantes, uh, you know, something good can come from yeah, yeah, yeah. incarceration. And I, you know, and I was like, Jesus Christ, and now I've got to read Don Quixote. And so, um, you know, so it's... Uh, I mean, 
the one thing one can you know say about uh, that environment mm. is that you know when you're basically chained to a table, mm. writing becomes a really really good outlet, and um, you know and a and a way to stay kind of sane mm. and to fall inside of another world. And so I wrote a lot when yeah. I was there. I wrote a lot. I wrote a lot of uh, screenplays, books. Uh, you know, I I was writing constantly. You know? And you feel like now at this point in your life looking back retrospectively at all your work and like the experiences you've kind of had do you feel kind of like now sitting at you feel like artistically kind of almost like i guess like i want to say deity but like kind of the way you can look back at your work and say okay my life's it must be cool to have your life ca- cat- cataloged i guess deity you mean like uh, godlike <laughs> God. no well, the, archive, <laughs> the because, opposite like, you look at, like, pop fiction say that was a reflection of what i was seeing at the time you can look back at rules of attraction that was a reflection of what it must yeah, be cool well to you know how that. you're different people throughout your life yeah you know, every seven years they say that the cells in your body are completely re- new mm, mm. that like you are literally a new person There's arguments that the self doesn't exist yeah yeah well, exactly. I mean, maybe the you know the, maybe the now, which is this kind of concept, three dimensional concept, doesn't exist. Yeah. And um, you're different people throughout your life. Every mm. seven years, you're literally a different person. But then, you know, you're a different person from when you're an infant to when you're seven years old to when you're fourteen mm. and going through puberty mm. and twenty one and uh, you know twenty eight, etc. You're literally different people, and so you have different things to say. Yeah. And you know, through different chapters of your life, and you know, I think it's a shame if you're not using whatever your art is. You know, even if you're not an artist, whatever, however you express yourself creatively, if you're not using it as a way to talk about about your life and what you're going through and mm. who you are in that moment, because you know, ultimately, what you want to do is look back in life and see who you were yeah. and what you went through, both the good and the bad. You know, I look back and there's a lot of things I'm proud of in my life, and there's a lot of things I'm not proud of in my life. And there's some things I've done that are really, really good. And there's some things I've done that are not so good and really, really bad. And, um, you know, that's what reflection, I suppose, is about, is, uh, you know, trying to constantly do course correction mm. so that, like your screenplay that evolves into becoming a movie, that you, hopefully through your life, evolve into being, despite the you know, the good or bad that happens to you, which does not actually define you. It's how you react to the good or bad that happens to you in life that defines who you yeah. are. And, you know, I think that's kind of important to, um, you know, use your creative work, again, whatever it is, to, uh, um, to make those discoveries about yourself. That's all any artist, I think, is trying to do or hoping to do. And whatever the, um, the medium is whether it's video games or mm. movies or books or painting or whatever. Yeah. You know, you're basically trying to see yourself at your most core level in that moment. Yeah. And and the maybe also the world around you and then mm. to put it on uh, you know, to put it into a form where somebody else can kind of experience Metaphorically, <laughs> you know the, what you what you're experiencing, what you've experienced, yeah. and what you've gone through. At least I think I don't know. I think that's an amazing way to finish. <laughs> We've been yeah. going for nearly two hours. Oh, I'm sorry. But no, I think that was that was an that was an amazing uh, <laughs> two hours. And yeah, thank you so much for coming. No, it's absolutely my it. my absolute pleasure. And uh, thank you for cool. uh, thank you for talking with me. Oh, Have a great cool. day. There's some people you want to know. Don't worry because he will say hello for you.